proponents of the Jesus Bloodline thesis argue that the assorted objectives and methods of the various secret societies seem to be in conflict. For example, the Priory of Sion seem to be interested in appointing members of the Bloodline to positions of political power, while the Rex Deus secret society is more interested in simply charting the Bloodline and keeping track of the family tree. Some of the societies, such as the Illuminati, even seem determined to undermine the very religious beliefs that give this bloodline its significance. However, tracking the bloodlines, establishing members of the family line in positions of power, and setting the path toward undermining the basic underpinnings that separate the various religious factions would not be incompatible with an overall plan to replace the current paradigm with a provable heir to the religious and political authority of the Novus Ordo Mundi. Additionally, there are rumors of secret societies in other non-Christian cultures, such as the Jewish Kabbalists, the Islamic Hassassin, and the Black Dragon Society of Japan. It's also true that the various societies have on occasion had some very public fallings out. Still, representatives of the various factions regularly meet and refine their plans and objectives. One such meeting occurred in 1954 in the Netherlands at the Hotel Bilderberg, News of the assembly leaked, and ever since the group has tacitly announced their meetings to assuage suspicion. So how would they ultimately go about establishing the validity of the claim? If they could produce a thoroughly detailed family history, this might go a long way toward impressing certain people. Several people, in fact, have proven a genetic link from Charlemagne to President George W. Bush. Several links, in fact. Therefore, a theoretic link exists from Bush to Christ. In fact, the theoretic linkage goes all the way back to Adam. However, none of this is provable without the genetic evidence. This brings us back to Egypt. According to the Bible, the Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians, and a hero named Moses was ordered by God to free them from Pharaoh and lead them to the Promised Land, a 300-mile journey that took 40 years, even though it can be walked in just a few weeks, which is irrelevant because the story is almost certainly fabricated. There is no extra scriptural evidence that the Egyptians ever enslaved anybody. Moreover, there is no evidence that there was ever an Egyptian prince named Moses. There is no record of him anywhere on any of the glyphs scattered throughout the region. Researchers and Egyptologists are continuously finding attempts at expunged recordings all the time, but nothing has ever been found about Moses. Surely, such an important event would have been recorded, even if only to later have an attempt made to eradicate it although there'd actually be no reason for the eradication of the evidence of Moses. Employing Occam's razor, a better explanation is that the story of Moses was invented to conceal the truth by the Israelites. What that truth is, however, doesn't concern us, only that the reality of it allows us to abandon the conceit that the Egyptians had enslaved the Hebrew people. Let's move on to explore something else that we know to be historically accurate. The Egyptians were excellent taxidermists who kept mummified organs and entire cadavers of their royal personages concealed for safekeeping. We also know that these vaults were frequently raided, and that despite the presence of gold and other valuables, often the only thing taken was the mummified remains. Additionally, a cast of priests were secretly educated in the techniques of embalming and preservation, and these and other religious secrets were guarded fiercely. Meanwhile. We also know that after the Hebrew people finally settled in Jerusalem, they built a temple which had an underground vault in which they hid something away. Centuries later, the Church of Rome led a crusade, set up a group of warrior monks to guard the temple, and that these monks raided the vault of that temple and became the richest men in the world. What if the thing that the Templars looted from beneath the Temple of Solomon had been previously raided and looted from the pyramids of Egypt centuries earlier? What if it was a cache of scrolls and genetic material that proved a line of secession different from the one purported by the Bible? What if it proved that the rites and ceremonies practiced by the Egyptians were secretly practiced by the Israelite kings, and that the family line taught in the book of Genesis was only partly true, and that the Egyptian pharaonic line and the Hebrew kingly line were blood relatives, factions of the same family which originated in Sumaria, the place referred to metaphorically as the Garden of Eden? Think about it. If it could be proven that the earliest known civilization, the Mesopotamian race of the Tigris and Euphrates, had originated a bloodline and established ceremonies that had carried through to the Egyptians and the Jews, and which the Roman Church had known about and suppressed while still elevating these kings and their progeny, this could be the secret which, after it was digested, would allow for the unification of all three major world religions. 
and some of the evidence would be still hidden in Sumer, in the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates, and the descendants of the bloodline might be willing to do anything to secure it, so they might add it to the evidence they already have. Iraq's National Library and National Archives, containing thousands of ancient manuscripts, were burnt down. To try to lay off the fact of that unfortunate uh, activity uh, on, on a defect in a war plan, it strikes me as a stretch. Well, weren't you urged specifically by uh, scholars and uh, others about the danger to that museum, and weren't you urged to provide a greater level of protection and security in the initial phases of the operation? Not to my knowledge. We had done a list of 20 sites that we thought needed to be protected. Um, historical, cultural, artistic, religious, and we had provided that, and it, it really made no difference whatsoever. The Iraq National Museum in Baghdad, number one on Orha's list, contained some of the world's most important artifacts of early human civilization. The museum was never protected. And some of the evidence would be still hidden in Sumer, in the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates, and the descendants of the bloodline might be willing to do anything to secure it so they might add it to the evidence they already have. They might, for example, invade the region on the flimsiest of pretexts, so that they might steal the evidence under cover of looting. So there you have it. Sacred geometry has been used for centuries by mysterious societies to conceal secrets and to use the force of those, perhaps literal, closeted skeletons to manipulate events and control the world's populations. Towers built on a massive scale to resemble minarets and helmeted cupolas happen to align with known natural geometry and point to locations which, from the moment of their discovery, have provided the best possible hiding place of their day. Groups designed for obscuring the distinctions between state entities and religious factions operate behind the scenes influencing public opinion and community perception. Wars are waged to further these secret agendas and gain control of the relics and evidence that is the source of this clandestine power. But here's the thing. Here's the ultimate point behind all of this. I don't buy it. I invented nothing here. Every factual statement I have made is 100% verifiable, but that doesn't mean the conclusions I've alluded to are the only possible ones. So what if Washington DC is designed on a pentagram? So what if Templar burial sites predating Columbus have been discovered in New England? So what if Rosalind Chapel in Scotland shows engravings that resemble corn, even though it was built well before 1492? So what if some Renaissance paintings show sticks held at some obscure angle? None of this means there's only one possible explanation, does it? And so what if George Bush can trace his family back to Charlemagne? Given the exponential growth of grandfathers everybody has as they trace their family tree backwards, every person of European consent can probably trace their lineage back to Charlemagne or some of his kin. Just because I was able to draw a map and line up points means nothing except that as a human being I have natural propensity for finding patterns. It could all be just a huge coincidence. A huge coincidence. Huge coincidence.